Good day and welcome to JCC Sunday Schools in Session, where Sunday School matters to God. Please like and subscribe to our channel. We would love for you to be a part of the JCC family. Today, our Sunday School lesson is titled, Ruth Follows Naomi, coming from Ruth chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, verse 14, only to the B portion, and verse 16. The book of Ruth is a book that sheds light in dark days of Judges. It's a book that describes God's plan of redemption. Our lesson this week focuses on two women, Naomi and Ruth, and their royal and their loyal love for one another. The lesson wants us to see that we can find refuge in the family of God. By the end of the lesson, we too leave behind our old life and cleave to what we choose to follow Christ. Let's unpack the lesson and see what it has to offer us today. Now, verses 1 and 2 read, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judea, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Imelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi, and the name of his two sons was Malon and Chilion, Ephratites of Bethlehem, Judea. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. Now, in our lesson, we see a few things before we get into the question. We see that a famine had came into the land, and this man, Amalek, chose to sojourn, meaning to temporarily stay in a particular place, which is Moab here. He also, we see the words Ephratites, which means fruitfulness, Bethlehem, which means the house of bread, and Judea, which means praise. So we see they're leaving a place where God's hand was, even though it was a famine, it was a place of fruitfulness, a place of house of bread, a place of praise, going to the country of Moab. Going to the washbowl is what it's called in the scripture. And we see that there are things are going to happen there. Let's begin with our question. Question one says, how does the portrayal of life in Israel differ in the books of Judges and Ruth? Now, the book of Ruth, in contrast to Judges, portrays a local community of those times undisturbed by warfare. It reveals peaceful contact between Israel and the Moabites. It shows that even in the time of apostasy, some still strongly trusted in the Lord. But this story takes place during the period of the judges known as the Dark Age. It was the Dark Ages for Israel. It was a time when there was no king, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes, as stated in Judges 21-25. It's a time of apostasy, which is a turning away from the one true God and doing whatever feels good, doing whatever I want to do because I'm going to serve myself. I am my own God. It was a time of self-seeking and self-centeredness when many people were doing what they thought was right in their own eyes and not doing what was right according to God's will. Now, this is important as a family, that in the beginning of this chapter, they never seek God's way. No, it's only their way. Yes, there was a famine going on, but we see they're only doing what they feel is right in their own eyes. They never talk to God about going to Moab because Moab symbolizes the world, doing it their way, false God, living a life that's separate from God. So we see that it, during this dark age, it was a time of judgment by God who had warned his people that if they turned from following him, the consequences was that of a physical and spiritual famine, that they would not have food, nor would they have the spiritual nourishment of him as well. And you can find that in Deuteronomy 28, verses 38 through 40. Now, question two says, where did Amalek and his family live and why did they go to Moab? They lived in Bethlehem, again, which literally means the house of bread. And we know that bread symbolizes a sustainment of life, but now there was no bread because of the family. So we see Amalek and his family left Israel for the land of Moab, a forbidden place for a child of God to live. 
Amalek and his wife Naomi are living in Israel, but because of the famine, they took and saw what was good for them and began to pursue it. They were in God's chosen land, yet we read their eyes began looking to the prosperity in Moab, again symbolizing the world. They see with their physical eyes and not their spiritual eyes to meet their needs. The picture for us is clear. We often do this here as well. It's a picture of a child of God. When times get hard, we look not to God, but we look to what the world can provide for us. We're looking with our physical eyes and not our spiritual eyes. People today find themselves in places where when the ends don't meet and God is taking too long to make things happen for them, to bring about the provisions that they need, they turn to the world. They turn to the pleasures of this world and sometimes God allows situations to come into our lives to teach us that we live by faith and not by sight. They heard and pictured that things were better in Moab, and they chose to go there. Just because someone says something is better, or we hear something is better, doesn't mean it's always that way. God's people have been told to stay in God's land and turn to him and he would provide. But Amalek enticed away by what looked good at the time that would answer his immediate needs, he saw a way, an opportunity to take matters into his own hands. In the end, it did not work out for him. I always say that everything that looked good to us is not always good for us. The prodigal son learned this as he ran from the far country. In the end, it took everything that he had they chose to leave the promised land for the forbidden land. Why do I say that? Let's read Deuteronomy 23, verses 3 through 6. It says, An Ammonite and Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Even to their tenth generation shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord forever. Because they met ye not with bread and with water in the way when ye came forth out of Egypt. And because they hired against thee Balaam, the son of Boar of Petor of Mesopotamia, to curse thee. And nevertheless, the Lord thy God would not hearken unto Balaam. But the Lord thy God turned the curse into a blessing unto thee, because the Lord thy God loved thee. Now, verse 6 is important. It says, Thou shalt not seek their peace, nor their prosperity, all the days forever. Notice what it says there. Thou shalt not seek their peace, nor their prosperity, nor the things that are going on in there, in the city or in the nation of Moab. We, as children of God, are never to pursue the things of the world. He's saying, rely on me. Don't pursue. Don't take matters into your own hands. Rely on me. See, the point is that Amalek left the promised land to seek help in a pagan land, and essentially lost everything, his life and his two sons. He lost his legacy. He lost everything that was tied to his legacy because he took matters into his own hands, and it cost him everything. Now, this was willful disobedience to the Word of God. It's showing us that Amalek is seeking to sort out problems in his own strength and not depend on the Lord. The Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. I believe we should never go where God has not taken us. If God don't lead us there, if God don't lead us to it, we don't need to walk that their destination. Why do I say that? Psalm 37, verse 3 through 4 says, Trust in Jehovah and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he shall give you the desire of your heart. And when we stay in the graces of God, when we stay in the confinements of God's perfect place for us, God will give us everything that we need. So when life gets too tough for us, what do we do? That, that's the emphasis there. That when life gets overwhelming, that when life gets hard, what do we do? The spiritual lesson from this is that in those times, we must live out Proverbs 
chapter 3, especially verse 5 and 6. We need to live it out. Why? Because we cannot be Christians. We cannot be Christians when times get hard and look not to God, but we look to the world to provide or even lean on our own understanding. That there will never bring about prosperity in a Christian's life. We need to trust the Lord to make a way out of no way for us. Question three says, who were the Moabites? and How had they dwelt in Israel? Moabite was a country southeast of Israel on the opposite side of the Dead Sea. Its people were the descendants of Lot through his oldest daughter incest with him. During the Israel's journey to Canaan, the king of Moab had resisted them by hiring Balaam to curse them. So we see that everything about Moabite is not good. It's on the opposite side of the Dead Sea. It comes from an ancestral lineage. It's tried to use an evil prophet to give money to speak evil and curse the nation. We see that this is not a place that a child of God should dwell. Verses 3 through 5 read, And Amalek, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left, and her two sons. And they took them wives of the woman of Moab. And the name of the one was Ophrah, and the name of the other was Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. And Malam and Chilion died also, both of them. And the women was left of her two sons and her husband. That sojourning what was supposed to be a small stay turned into something long. And Imelech and both his sons, we see here, they died. Turning to the world will make us stay too long and cost us too much. Let me say that again. If we turn to the world versus God, it'll make us stay too long and it'll make it cost too much. The prodigal son learned this the hard way that the world promises can quickly turn to the world curses. The world promises fame, fortune, and fulfillment. But we see here, the prodigal son learned that what he had left was way better than what he had right now. We have to be careful chasing the dream and ending up with a nightmare. Question four says, what peril attached the marriage of Israel to Moabite? Intermarriage posed a spiritual danger since Moab worshiped a false god. It was Moabite women who seduced Israel to worship Baal Peor in the wilderness. That's how Balaam defeated the, the Israelites. He wasn't able to speak a curse. But what he did, he put before him the women of Moabite to che- make them choose to go in and begin to worship false gods. And this is the problem anytime we have the wrong connection. That when we are trying to do God's work, but we connect it with things of the world, it'll cause a problem. Verse 5 says, what tragedies befell this Israelite family in Moab? They disintegrated. The only ones left were the widows. The two men and the, and the husband died. And these two young women could do very little for Naomi. Question 6, what kind of future did Naomi face after her husband and son died? She was a woman without, a, without support. So what I'm saying is that they didn't have, she didn't have any financial support. Naomi was facing the end of her family name. She was too old to have sons. She was ultimately headed for destruction. And because she had no money, she had no support system from her sons, she was in a place where she was headed for destruction. It's just like that same thing with us. If we don't have God, if we don't have his son, Jesus Christ, then we too will be headed for destruction. I want us to see that this book is not just trying to tell us a history or a story. It's trying to tell us a spiritual significance that we need God in our lives to help us to be fruitful and help us to be able to, to go and do all the things that he's called us to do. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how the Lord had visited his people and given them bread. Wherefore she sent forth out of the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judea. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as he dealt with the 
the dead, and with me. The Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. Question says, and what factors led Naomi to decide to return to Bethlehem? Naomi therefore decided to return to Bethlehem when she heard the news that the Lord had shown favor on them. Again, the book of Judges teaches us that God brought relief when the people repented and returned to God. And this was the thing the people in Israel turned from their wicked ways and began to seek God. And this here brought about a change. In the nation. So Christ teaches us that the prodigal son, the power of repentance and the returning to his father, that there brought about a transformation. It brought about change for him. And Naomi had come to her senses, just like the prodigal son. They knew it was time to go home. After they were at rock bottom, they looked up. Sometimes we got to fall flat on our back to look up to God to understand. Life is better with God than it is trying to do it our way. This is our prayer like the prodigal son and Naomi for our loved ones. They will come to their senses and find their way home. It's best to return to God than remain in the world that's going to only lead to destruction. Question 8 says, how did Naomi's daughter-in-law initially respond when she urged them to remain in Moab? Naomi again realized it was better to go back home for herself. So she kissed Opa and Ruth as she anticipated saying goodbye. But this merely only stirred up emotion. They broke out crying. They protested that they wanted to stay with Naomi. Naomi is doing what she thinks is best for them, but they want to remain with her. Now the B portion of verse 14 reads, Oprah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. Question answer, why did Oprah return to her home? Having been forced to examine her values, Oprah decided that becoming a wife again was more important than remaining a daughter-in-law to Naomi. She counted the cost to look back at what she had in the land and did not want to leave it. Sometimes that's the same thing with many people today. They go back in and think where they are, where they came from, is so much better than going to something new with God. Question 10 says, what level of commitment is expressed in Ruth's cleaving to Naomi? Her life would henceforth be with Naomi. Whatever that sacrifice was, she was willing to make it. The Hebrew term for cleave indicates the closest possible loyalty and affection that someone could have. See. We see here, again, Oprah, which her name means stiff neck, wanted to follow Naomi to the promised land. But again, she counted the cost and decided that she wanted the security and the enticement that she felt Moab, which is a symbolism of the world, had. See, faced with the reality of following God, she chose to remain in her comfort zone. But Ruth, which name means friendship, saw the big picture. She saw that it's better to be with Naomi to remain in a current state and condition. She understood as she counted the cost, counted the cost to transform, counted the cost not to conform and stay in Moab, stay in the world, but no, I'm going to transform so I can go and be with Naomi. And this is a spiritual point for us to leave behind the world and pursue the kingdom to leave our past life and take on the new life. Verse 16 says, And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whether thou goest, I'll go. And where thou lodgest, I'll lodge. Thy people shall be my people and thy God, my God. See, in this verse, we see the lasting commitment and dedication of Ruth. This is an agape love on display. She was willing to leave family and tradition to stay with Naomi. She says in the text, thy people shall be my people and thy God shall be my God. She's confessing loyalty to God first and foremost to the nation and to Naomi symbolizing family. What spiritual point can we glean from this? She was willing again to show us 
how she was willing to transform. She was willing to become a child of God, to remain in the vicinity of the people of God. She was willing to leave the old and take on the new, to allow the old man to be done away with and allow a new connection, a new lease on life to be taken place with God, with the new people, as well as with her mother-in-law. This is what we, we do when we come to Christ as well. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. We then identify with the new family. Ruth, in the natural world, was no longer a Moabite. She became a child of God. She wanted to be part of God's family. She made a choice and a commitment that altered her life and Naomi's as well. So it goes in and asks the question, are we counting the cost to follow Jesus? The decision that we make to truly follow Christ. Ruth had to truly count the cost. She was willing to make the sacrifice to do so. And this is what God wants from us as well. Ruth is welcome into the family and the community of God. And we too are welcome when we truly count the cost to be committed to Christ. What does it take? Ruth's story shows us that we have to, to deny ourselves. Make a commitment to take up a cross and follow after Christ. This is the mark of a true disciple that Christ said. To be truly in the family. As I told you, this book he is trying to show us, as it shows, starting out in this first chapter, how to get some things right, how to get properly in position, in the proper place, doing the proper thing to get the proper blessing that God has for us. We first must learn to turn away from our old self, our old ways, and take upon the new ways of God. Praise be to God. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the lesson. If you enjoyed everything, please leave us a thumbs up, a like, and subscribe to our channel. We surely would love for you to become a part of our family. Also, please leave us a comment as we will look to comment back with to you as well. Well, until next we come back, same time, same channel. Be blessed now.